All right, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at chapter three. And we're going to talk about process costing. And we are basically going to see how in a process costing system, we will gather our various costs that we've seen in chapter two, basically our manufacturing costs, which are going to be what? Our direct materials, direct labor, and our overhead, right? Okay, so let me get this thing started. Got to take it out of presenter view, and we're good to go. All right. So we're talking about process costing. Now, process costing is used when we are talking about special order items, unique items. Okay. We do not use process costing if we're talking about producing homogeneous items. That is the subject of Chapter 4 when we talk about process costing. So if we're producing cornflakes, since every box of cornflakes is the same, we would use a process costing system. If we're talking about a unique special order type item, then we would use job order costing and we will gather our costs as we produce each item. So they have some examples up here. If you're producing an airplane and you so happen to be Boeing or something, a fighter jet is going to be much different than a what? Passenger jet. A, you know, one of these little, you know, uh, prop jobs is going to be much different than what? Than a 747, whatever, right? So we gather our costs by job, by item as we produce it, okay? Uh, another example is whatever this thing is, and I have no idea in the middle, so I'm just going to, I don't know what that is, but I'm just going to make one up. Talk about houses, let's say, what happens? Each house is different, isn't it? Okay, yeah, you may have the frame and the foundation being the same, but as soon as they start putting in a countertop for this person, counter cabinets for this person, they start, what, getting different, and so they would gather each cost by the cost of that particular unit, whatever it is, right? Okay, movies, a, you know, romantic comedy is going to be a lot different than, you know, what is the name of that company that makes Toy Story and all that, uh, huh? Pixar movie, right, that's all computer generated, that sort of thing, okay? So each item is different, so we gather our cost by job, okay? Now you come over, and uh, I give you large aircraft, such as Boeing, that's right off the slide, is what? Job order costing, right? A job order production system would be appropriate for a company that produces which one of the following items? Let's start from the bottom. Small gardening tools. Um... There is a show called uh, How's It Made, okay, and I like to watch that show sometimes, and, you know, they'll show how they're making different things, and one day I'm watching it, and they're showing how they make, you know, rakes and that kind of stuff, and what? They have a lathe that makes the wood part of the rake, and then they have, you know, a, a, a molding formatting that makes all the rakey part of the rake, whatever you call that, the, sp the spokes of the rake, whatever, and what? They mass produce those, don't they? Well, that's a job order costing system because what? Each rake is different. Now, sometimes people say, well, wait a minute. The rake you use for gardening vegetables is different than the rake you use to rake up your lawn. Well, that's okay. That's a different lot of items that they're making, but each one of the items in that lot is what? Exactly the same, right? Uh, packets of flower, uh, flower seeds are obviously going to be what? Homogeneous. All the seeds will kind of go down the conveyor belt, drop into the seed bag, whatever. Seedlings for sale in a nursery. Little trees are going to be what? Exactly the same. They don't sit there and name the trees and say, now you're Bobby. We're going to give you more water than little Johnny tree over here. They just go ahead and they treat them all exactly the same, right? But if we're dealing with what? landscaping design for a new hospital well yeah if you're doing the landscaping design for a hospital if it's you know you know little eden hospital in castro valley you'll have one type of landscaping if it's stanford hospital then it's going to have what different type of landscaping maybe you're not doing all hospitals maybe you're doing some what residential landscaping going to be different than a business type landscaping so each job would be unique to the customer's desires right okay so that would be job order costing Okay, all right, I won't go too deep on that on the exam because I always end up in arguments with my students every time I have one of these questions and they miss it. No one argues when they get it right, but when they miss it, they say, well, 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 well that can actually be process, process job order because... 
So I try not to get into those with you guys too much, so I won't go too heavy on questions like that because I don't like those kind of discussions too much. Actually, I do. I don't know why you guys don't care about this right now. Let me put it on a test. You'll be the most passionate people in the world about why this is process or job order. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at how job order costing will work. And notice we are able to trace our direct labor, our direct materials directly to each one of these jobs. Piece of cake, right? You use a piece of metal making this uh, car or whatever, you can trace that to car one, car two, car three. The guy spends an hour on each job, you can trace that one, two, three, right? Okay. Now you come over, and when we're talking about manufacturing overhead, we have to get those costs over to each job. But rather than sit there and trace them directly, we will have to apply them using that predetermined manufacturing overhead rate that we talked about. So we'll have to do what? We'll have to sit there and gather all of our costs in a pool and then estimate what it's going to be per direct labor hour or whatever and apply it every time we spend a direct labor hour on that job. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just see how we would gather those costs. And this is something called a job order cost sheet. And I have no idea why there's a pair on here. I was looking at that. And I'm like, I don't know what does the pair mean? I can't remember. Okay, so what happens? We go over and we use some direct materials. Okay, and we use some lumber, whatever the heck this stuff is. And we get the cost of that. It's 116. And we go ahead and since we can trace that directly to the job, we stick that on the job order cost sheet, right? Now we got the wood. We start to have somebody do some labor. So this guy charged eight hours at eleven dollars an hour. That's eighty-eight bucks. That's to working directly on that, and so that's now eighty-eight dollars. So we got our direct labor, direct material. See what a piece of cake that is. Okay. Now you come over and you start to take a look at this next slide, guys, and you know. If you're trying the thing of um, I'll just keep my phone below the table and Lord won't know that I'm looking at it, I know. I can see through the table. Okay, I know when you're looking at your phone. So keep your eyes on the material here because all of a sudden you look up and you're like, I didn't know that he was going to teach this class in Spanish. He's speaking Spanish right now because I don't understand anything he's saying. Okay, so stay with me. Okay, and so what happens? When we have to allocate or... I think better word is apply those costs to each job. We will use something called an uh, application base. We will call it a driver, okay? And that driver can be direct labor hours often. We use that. It could be machine hours. It could be direct labor dollars, okay? It just really depends on what the company thinks drives their overhead. Okay, if most of our overhead is made up of indirect labor, then I think direct labor hours might be a reasonable if we know that the supervisor is the one that's driving all those indirect costs and we have to keep adding supervisors because we're spending so much hours of labor on that. If it's that plant that made the ammonium perchlorate, right, the oxidizer that makes the solid rocket fuel burn in uh, missiles and stuff. Why is solid rocket fuel so important? Why does the fuel have to be solid? Why do they get all nervous when uh, um, what in North Korea developed solid rocket fuel? That's when they got scared. Why is the solid fuel a big deal? It's lighter. If you have to have what? If you have to have liquid fuel, liquid fuel is going to be much heavier. So it's harder for a missile to what? Carry the, and the other big deal is the hydrogen bomb is smaller and is more explosive. So it's harder what? To carry it. So you have to have solid rocket fuel, right? Okay. So this is the kind of weird things you learn when you work for the GAO. Like, why does he know all that? Because I was on a job where they explained to us why well, solid rocket fuel is a big deal. And it burns if you use ammonium perchlorate. But you can't make ammonium perchlorate unless you have a lot of electricity because it somehow scatters the atoms around enough so that they can make this stuff that burns easily. Anyway, so the reason I say that is I was watching the news. They were talking about, you know, the Korean nuclear program and I'm like how come I understand what they're talking about right okay so anyway but solid rocket fuel whatever but if you use a lot of electricity then what then the electricity should be your cost driver the kilowatt hours of electricity whatever drives your overhead cost that's what you should use as your driver 
Okay. Now um, we do this when we have costs that are difficult or impossible to trace the products, so we're going to have to apply those. Okay. And we talked about the different types of things. Grease using machine would be indirect materials. The what supervisor salary, indirect labor, and then we have the others like our utility bill, our depreciation, etc. Right. And then you have um, um, that they can be both fixed and variable and they don't say it here but what often mixed as well like for the utility okay okay good so when we come up with our predetermined manufacturing overhead overhead rate we take our estimated total manufacturing cost for the coming period and we divide that by the estimated total units that we think we'll be using in our allocation base whatever our driver is how do we come up with the estimated total manufacturing overhead cost for the coming period the numerator in this fraction Huh? Last year's data, and we use maybe, do you like to be high or low when you come up with it? Huh? Low. You like to be low? Okay, you can be low. Some people like to be high. You could use either the high or the low in our little rudimentary method. Probably regression analysis would be a little more sophisticated. Good. That allows us to come up with the total. We divide that by whatever the driver is. We have our predetermined manufacturing overhead rate, right? Now, when you look at this next slide, I'm showing you the way we're determining the to overhead cost at with the fixed portion, the variable portion, fixed pushing up the variable total cost. And in this example, they're saying Y equals AX plus B. We kind of remembered Y equals MX plus B to tie it back to. Where did you guys learn algebra? Junior high? I didn't learn until college, so that's why I'm asking. I learned nothing in junior high or high school, for that matter, about math anyway. I can tell you all about behind F Hall and the politics of uh, F Hall, but I can't tell you anything about math. So Y equals what? MX plus B, whatever. Or we could go ahead and do what? Just simply turn it into something that actually represents what we're talking about. And we said, okay, total overhead cost is equal to what? The fixed cost plus the variable cost per unit times the number of units in the driver, direct labor hours, kilowatt hours, whatever it is, right? Okay. And since our cost function works that way, we were able to assign the high-low method to it, and we went through this little exercise, right? Questions on any of this? I should have some memorable music that goes with this, just so you're remembering. Ding, 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 ding. Remember when we talked about this and we went ahead and did this problem? Okay, I'm not going to repeat it because I'm looking at you thinking you pretty much remember it. We just did all this Monday, didn't we? Okay. Okay, good. So, however you do it, or how, you know, high low method, whatever it is, but at the end, you end up saying, okay, using Y equals, in this case, A, A, A plus BX, whatever A is the fixed cost, B is the variable cost per unit, X is the number of units. You plug everything in, what you estimate it's going to be, that's the numerator. The denominator is what? The number of units that you think you're going to have. In this example, it was what? Direct labor hours. So they picked up 160,000 direct labor hours. See, I got all excited when I saw this podium up here. Remember I kept complaining? Did I complain to you guys that I don't like if they don't give me a podium here? And now here's a podium. Isn't this beautiful right here? I don't have to hang on the over the thing anymore. I used to hate that. I'd feel like, you know, a guy who his football team lost. You know, I'm just sitting there at the bar. I can't believe the Raiders lost again. Okay. All right. But now I can stand up. Okay. You know you're getting old when you get excited about this kind of stuff. Okay. So what happens? 160,000 is what was used with my what? For my variable cost. And then I still take those number of units and divide that into my total estimated overhead cost. That gives me now my predetermined manufacturing overhead rate, which in this example was $4. Okay. So I go ahead and... We take a look, and um, in this example, since we had eight direct labor hours, we multiply that by the manufacturing overhead rate of what? $4 that we just calculated using regression analysis, high-low method, whatever. And we assign, we apply what? $32 of overhead cost to this job. Why? Because it used eight hours of 
direct labor, right? Did we accomplish the goal? Did we get our overhead cost applied over there? Okay, so we got our direct labor, our direct materials, our manufacturing overhead. We've got our product cost, don't we? We've got our manufacturing cost. Okay. Okay, good. Question? All right. Let's look at this question from the uh, quiz for this chapter. Now, the bad thing is, uh, I don't know if they should have put it on the other side. And it should have had wheels. <laughs> okay. Getting too old for this. Okay, so we've got this Hibsman Corporation bases its predetermined overhead rate on the estimated machine hours for the upcoming year. At the notice, guys, it's not direct labor hours. We don't have to have direct labor hours. Could be machine hours, couldn't it? Okay. And so we say at the beginning of the most recently completed year, the corporation estimated machine hours for the upcoming year of 10,000. The estimated manufacturing overhead was 682 per machine hour, and estimated fixed cost is 230,200. Who can set up for me the uh, way to get the total overhead cost anyway before we get the predetermined rate? Huh? What? Good. Plus? Plus the fixed cost, good, of 230200 Beautiful. That gives me a total of? That gives me a total of two hundred and ninety-eight thousand. You say four hundred. Okay, good. And then I'm going to do what? Divide that by the ten thousand machine hours, right? Gives me the answer here: twenty-nine eighty-four. Was that a good year? Was 2984 a good year? We don't know yet, do we? Maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. But then Elon Musk will be a robot. do is lose about 50 pounds and this would be perfect. Oh, just kidding. Okay. Kind of. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say we have a job and a job uses up 100 machine hours, what would be the overhead for that job? Set it up. We would take what? 2984. 2984 times what? Times 100 hours, 100 machine hours. So the cost would be what? 2,984, right? Okay, okay, good. Let's take a look at uh, this one. Um, job cost shows information about the following items except what? How about direct labor cost? Job order cost sheet have direct labor cost? Right, how about the name of the customer? Okay, how about cost incurred by the marketing department? And that is what a non a non manufacturing cost that is therefore what not a product cost that is therefore not on the what 
not on the job order cost sheet, right? We would expense that. Remember, guys, we're trying to get these costs where? We're trying to get them over to work in progress, then what? Then finish goods, and then when we sell it, it'll go to cost of goods sold, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. Just so that we're sure we know what's what, we have what? If overhead is applied on the basis of direct labor hours, the overhead rate per hour will be, well, first we're challenged by what? You wouldn't have the solution down here, guys. This is the solution. So first we're challenged by, in this problem, by that we have to know indirect cost from direct to be able to put it in the overhead pool to begin with, don't we? That's step one in this problem. So uh, what is the direct materials? Is that overhead? No. No. How about direct labor? No. no. How about rent on factory building? Yes. Yeah, we can pick that up. How about uh, sales salaries? No. That's expense. That's an administrative cost. Depreciation on factory building? No. Got that. How about indirect labor? No. Yep. How about supervisor salary? Supervisor is the what? is the sort of classic example of an indirect labor, right? So we add all those up, that's 45,000. They tell me that what? We estimate direct labor hours as our driver. We divide then the total over estimated overhead cost by the $20,000, uh, 20,000 direct labor hours. That gives us this 225. Okay, just for kicks, ask you again. If a job uses 10 hours, then we will apply what? 2250, I guess. Even I can do that one in my head. Okay, all right, so a little different than the other one we saw and that we had to go through and know the difference between direct and indirect. It wasn't too bad. Okay, good. Now, we're going to now start to get into using debits and credits to move cost through our accounting system. You don't mind debits and credits, right? You love debits and credits. Nothing happens in an accounting system without what? Debits and credits. So we can sit here all day saying, hey, we're going to apply the manufacturing overhead to our jobs. And, uh, you know, it's not like we wave a magic wand and the accounting system has all those costs. We have to move them by debits and credits, don't we? Okay. So that's where we're going now. Okay. We're going to see that costs are going to move out of our raw materials into our work in progress. They don't show it here, but we're going to have to incur some salaries payable to have our what? To have our uh, direct labor get into our work in progress. We will apply our manufacturing overhead into our work in progress using our predetermined manufacturing overhead rate. And then once a job is completed, we will take those costs out of work in progress and put them into finished goods, out of finished goods, and then when they're sold into cost of goods sold. Okay. So as I said in the first couple of days, we are really now in a, in a situation where we are finishing up your business 20, your financial accounting discussion now for a what? Manufacturing operation, right? That's really what we're doing with all this okay so we start out with our raw materials and when we purchase the raw materials we will debit raw materials will credit cash or accounts payable right when we buy those materials then when we are ready to move our materials into production we will of course credit the raw material and debit work in progress as we move those materials out of our materials account and into our work in progress right we will then go ahead and what? Have to have some indirect materials, some grease or whatever. So we'll credit that out of our raw materials and debit into the actual manufacturing overhead. And those costs are going to sit in there, the actuals. And the way we're going to get them over to the work in progress is going to be by debiting work in progress and crediting what? The manufacturing overhead applied because we have to apply it using the predetermined manufacturing overhead rate. Okay, So we just show you the journal entries in general journal form. We purchase the raw materials, debit the raw materials, credit the accounts payable, the cash, whatever. 
as we, and the word is requisition. Requisition is a fancy word for request. The production manager requests some raw materials. Raw materials to job number 543. Raw materials to number job number 543. Okay, and what happens? They're requesting them, aren't they? So when they requisition the materials, they go ahead and they debit work in progress, in this example, for 40000 And if it was indirect materials, a little grease in all the machines, please. A little grease. And all the machines, please. And so they go ahead and they requisition some grease. Out it goes into the what? Not directly to the jobs work in progress, but to manufacturing overhead, right? The actual side is a debit. Okay. Okay, good. And we come over. You guys look like you never worked in a factory before. Did you never worked in a factory? Oh, you missed out. Okay. When I was in between my junior and senior year in high school, I told you the story. My dad made me work like at a, in a factory. He got me. He didn't make me. I wanted a job, right? So, so I made, you know how much I was making? Five bucks an hour, man. I was a man about town with that five bucks an hour in this factory job. So you get in there, and, you know, it's this factory that makes micro computer chips. I don't know what the heck it was making. And those parts for those things you have to take all the rough parts off of them and they had different ways to do it and one of them was to put it in this caustic uh, chemical and you would sit there and you'd have to rock the thing back and forth and you'd have to do that for like you know 12 minutes per rack till all the rough stuff was off the edges whatever and while you're doing this all this you know toxic steam is coming up in your face, you know, and you're sitting there going, geez, you know, 12 minutes, this has been at least 12 minutes, you look at the clock, it's two minutes, okay, let me do it, okay, it must be lunchtime, you look, it's nine o'clock, oh, I just got here at 8.30, okay, so anyway, so that was when I said I better go to college, right, okay, so you miss out, right, because when you're in a factory all day long, you hear a little more toxic materials in John's bin, come in there and they dump some more stuff, whatever. Okay. And that would be what? Indirect. We put it on the debit side of the manufacturing overhead. And when we're ready, we will what? Apply it to the work in progress, right? Okay. And so uh, that's uh, what's going on with those journal entries. Okay. Okay, good. Now we go through the direct labor. And with the direct labor and indirect labor, we're going to do what? We're going to credit salaries payable, whatever. We'll probably pay our employees every other week or something. So we put in the payable. If it's a direct, the cost of the job that the person's actually working on, then we go ahead and you spend some hours on that. We debit that to work in progress. If it's indirect labor, the janitors, the supervisors, whatever, will do what? We'll debit the actual side of the manufacturing overhead, and then we're going to apply it over. Okay, okay, good. Then you see the uh, general journal version of that. Debit the work in progress for the direct. Debit the manufacturing overhead for the indirect. And of course, since this is labor, we're going to credit salaries payable. We'll pay them later. Okay, good. So we've got what? We've got direct labor. We've got direct materials. And we're at least setting up our indirect in the what? In the manufacturing overhead, the debit side, right? Okay. Now, don't forget, we have to get the others. Remember the others? Okay, so that's things like, what, depreciation, et cetera? Okay, so unlike what you do in financial accounting all the time where they have you debiting depreciation expense, we're trying to get the cost of depreciation to our product, aren't we? So we'll debit work in progress and credit accumulated depreciation. We debit work in progress and credit utilities payable. We debit work in progress and credit property taxes payable. Whatever those others are, you set up the payables, you set up the accumulated depreciation. Instead of the debits being to expense, the debits are to the actual side of work in progress, right? So if you think about our work in progress account right now, it's sitting there with all of these actuals, isn't it? Okay. But we need to get it to work in progress, and the way we get it to work in progress is by taking the predetermined manufacturing overhead rate, multiplying it by the amount of direct labor hours, whatever the driver is that was incurred for this particular job, and boom, we have moved those costs, what, out of the manufacturing overhead and over to the work in progress, haven't we?
right? It went up by debits. It came down by a credit, didn't it? Now, if this was perfect, the manufacturing overhead would be zero now, wouldn't it? But it's not going to be the case that my manufacturing overhead is going to exactly match what I apply. My actual isn't going to exactly match what I apply. Do we worry about that? At the end of the period, we will simply fix that. Don't worry. I got a fix for that. Uh -huh. Because there was some mayonnaise on that sandwich over there, but we didn't want to track it directly. Right? Is there mayonnaise on that sandwich? Is mayonnaise an indirect cost? Do we want to consider the cost of the mayonnaise on that sandwich? So we got the bread, we got the meat, we got the cheese, we got the sandwich maker's time that, that uh, they spent on it. So now we need to get the cost of the mayo over there, don't we? So we can't put it directly, so we apply it using the predetermined overhead rate. Now we got the cost of the mail over there, right? Okay, that's all we're doing. Now it's not going to match perfect. It's not like, oh, geez, you came up with the perfect predetermined. You are the Nostradamus of managerial cost accounting, whatever they call this class, because you sat there and you guessed it exactly what the pre. That's amazing. It's going to be off. Don't worry. We wouldn't want to be off if we were building a bridge, you know. Gee, you know, how many cars went in the water, Bob? Oh, 17. Okay, well, let's put a little more weight on this side, see. Oh, darn. Now 18 cars went off the other side. Well, we're almost there. No, okay, what are you going to do? If you're, when you're dealing with accounting, it's no big deal. We'll just fix it with a journal entry at the end, right? When, before we issue our financial statements, no one's going to die. Okay, but we try to get it as close as we can, you know. It's making it sound like, okay, who cares? I don't mean it that way because we try to be as accurate as we can month to month, et cetera. We don't want to be sitting there at the end of the year with this nightmare that we can't figure out why we're so far off, right? So month to month, we'll make this adjustment that you'll see in a little while, okay? All right, but we're going to go ahead and apply it. And so you can see the journal entry. We debit the work in progress. That's bringing the manufacturing overhead cost over to this particular job. Guys, I know, and this is annoying about this example. Remember they said the rate was $4, and now they're just pulling $3.50 out of who knows where. Okay, so I don't know why they just flipped it to three fifty, dollars But whatever, the predetermined overhead rate is times the what? Times the driver, and now it's machine hours in this example. That's how much we apply to the work in progress, right? Just like we were doing in those problems, I was asking you the number. I did not ask you the journal entry. Well, the way you would go ahead and get that number over to work in progress is by debiting it and crediting what? The uh, manufacturing overhead, the credit on the actual side. So we're crediting on this side for, I mean, excuse me, on the applied side. So we're crediting for the applied. It's going over to work in progress. Okay? Okay, good. Then we have what? Our non-manufacturing costs. We know we're selling it administrative. We will simply expense those, right? That's a piece of cake. Those go straight to my expenses, right? Okay, now right now, my what? Meanwhile, back at the um, work in progress account, I'm sitting there with all those costs I've gathered. And I've gathered what? I've gathered my manufacturing cost here, haven't I? My direct materials, my direct labor, my overhead, we call those what? Very important, guys. Manufacturing costs. Sometimes the battle in this class is keeping all the terms straight, right? Because we keep calling different things different things, okay? So we're calling the sum of our direct materials, our direct labor, our overhead. We call that manufacturing costs. We've gathered those in work in progress. We're successful. Direct labor was a piece of cake. Direct materials was a piece of cake. We had to do a little applying to get the uh, overhead over there, but we've got it. And that's our total manufacturing cost. And when we are done with a particular job, we take all of our manufacturing cost out of work in progress and by crediting it and debiting it into finished goods inventory. We've got finished goods now, don't we? We've got finished goods sitting there, okay? Now, by definition, 
the amount that you subtract out of work in progress by crediting it and debit into finished goods by definition is called cost of goods manufactured. Think about it. It is a very descriptive term, isn't it? Cost of goods manufactured. Notice it's sort of a past tense, meaning you're done with those, aren't you? If something's in progress, are we done with it? No, we're not. So it sits in work in progress until we're what? Done with it. Then it becomes cost of goods manufactured. It comes out of work in progress and goes into finished goods waiting for what? Waiting to be sold, waiting for the customer to come. And since this is a job order costing system, I'm thinking pretty much we call the customer at that point and say, hey, your new Cessna jet is ready. That's a telephone, not a cup of coffee. Your new jet is ready. And they say, okay, I'll be right over to pick it up. And they drive it home. Right? So they're just waiting for them to come get this thing now? It's sitting in finished goods? This is where what? This is where financial accounting begins. We start with this thing, don't we? You debited your inventory, was finished when you bought it. You sit there, you credit cash, credit accounts payable, whatever, and then what? And then a little bit later, the person comes in, buys it, you do what? Credit your inventory, debit cost of goods sold using a perpetual system. Okay, so now we're in a very familiar area for us. When we finally sell that, we do what? We credit, oh, sorry, here's the journal entry. Debit the uh, finished goods, credit the work in progress for the ones that are finished. And then we do what? We debit cost of goods sold, credit finished goods for the hello cost of goods sold, whatever we sold, right? Question? Okay. I'm not so interested in this schedule. I think they make so much out of this schedule and who it's like. What are, did I tell you guys about the Who Cares channel? Okay, I mean, this should be on the Who Cares channel. How do you make up a, a um, what did they call this stupid thing? I don't even know what they call it. I so much don't care about it. How do you prepare a schedule of cost of goods manufactured? Okay. And I don't care about this, okay? But let's just look at it real quick, okay? So you have what? You have your raw materials. And this is the only reason this thing is worthwhile to us and that it could help us to solve some of the problems that we're going to be looking at later. So you have your beginning inventory plus your what? Raw materials purchased for the period gives me the raw materials available for use. And then what? If I wanted to figure out how much I actually used, I could subtract the ending inventory, and that'll tell me the raw materials have been used. Okay? And then what? Then in my manufacturing cost, I will do what? Take my direct materials, direct labor, the manufacturing overhead applied. As I told you, that is what? Total manufacturing cost for the period, right? That adds up in my work in progress. I have my total work in progress for the period, and if I subtract it off my ending inventory, whatever it is, that would give me what? The cost of goods manufactured, that's what's been transferred out of what? Out of work in progress and into finished goods, right? Cost of goods manufactured, okay? And then you come over, and uh, I guess this goes to finished goods somehow. Minus what gives you the beginning inventory plus the uh, cost of goods manufactured gives you whatever's available. Minus the ending finished goods could give you then whatever you had subtracted the cost of goods sold. So this is just showing you how you can calculate these different numbers. Okay, let's just go over though and let's look at a couple of potential uh, midterm questions. Okay, and uh, you take a look. And we have all of these T accounts. Does this question look hard? When you see all these T accounts? Right? This is one of those questions where you automatically freak out when you see this. You're like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do here? And then you read, 
and it says Sharp uses a job order costing system and applies overhead to jobs based on direct labor cost. What is the amount of cost of goods manufactured? This is the easiest question in the world, isn't it? Cost of goods manufactured is the amount that does what? Comes out of work in progress and goes into finished goods for the period? Hello? So the answer is what? 251000 Let that be a lesson to you. Never freak out when you see a question like that. That's a piece of cake. It's simply what? A definitional question. We said, going back, never mind this stupid schedule, just going back to what we learned right here. We said that the cost of goods manufactured is what we had finished that came out of work in progress and went into finished goods. Isn't that the number I picked up? Isn't that the number I picked up? So what's the cost of goods manufactured? How, what do we define it as, the cost of goods manufactured? Good, it's the amount, very good. It's the amount that's done what? Come out of work in progress and gone into what? Finished goods. Good. Okay, good. Okay. And so when you look at this question, now this question is a piece of cake. Even though you saw those T accounts up there and it seemed hard, the question asked you what is the cost of goods manufactured? It's the amount that came out of work in progress and went into finished goods for the period, right? Okay, good. How about this one? And uh, this one wants to know the cost of goods manufactured, doesn't it? So it must be asking me what came out of work in progress for the period. Okay. Now you look at this thing and uh, they start giving me information about the work in progress account. So I'm kind of thinking that I'm going to have to analyze work in progress to figure out what got subtracted out of work in progress, right? This is asking me for the cost of goods manufactured that gets subtracted out of work in progress. And I quickly look at the problem. I don't see anything about finished goods, so I guess I'm stuck with analyzing work in progress, right? Okay. So I go ahead, and the way I analyze these, I don't use T accounts. God made T accounts to tell you what the balance is in an account at any point in time. In these questions, I'm not going to be asking you probably the ending balance. I'm going to be asking you what was the subtract, what was the add to the account. So your best bet, setting it up like this, and I use this to remember B, A, S, E, base, we have a what? We have a beginning balance. We have adds to the accounts. We have what? subtracts for the account, which is what we're looking for because that's the cost of goods manufactured to answer this question, and we have an ending balance. Good. So we start to look at this, and they say that the balance in the work in progress account at the beginning of the month was 10000 Piece of cake. I don't resist the question. I use the ninja approach. I take any energy there is from the question to use it against it to destroy it. Did you guys ever see that movie Ghost Dog? You never saw Ghost Dog with Forrest Whitaker? Okay, you got to check that movie out. He's like a hit man. He shoots people. But then after each time he kills somebody, he puts up like this ninja thing about what it all meant that he shot that person. So we can apply that here, right? Don't use any energy against yourself. Use it against the question. We put the beginning balance in. Is that what you wanted? To tell me to put the beginning balance was 20? Okay, good. Now what? We read on a little bit further, and we say that at the end of the month, it was what? 10,000. So we stick that in using the ninja approach. Don't fight it. Okay, good. During the month, the corporation incurred direct materials of 50, direct labor cost of 22. Uh-oh. They're trying to tell me what my manufacturing cost, aren't they? And I know that my manufacturing cost, once I accumulate them, is going to be what? 
and add to my work in progress, right? So I have direct materials. Is that a manufacturing cost? Yep, I put that 50 there. Uh, direct labor, is that a manufacturing cost? Yes, it is. I picked that up, 22,000. They tell me the annual, the actual, excuse me, manufacturing overhead is 58,000. Should I pick that up? It's what? It's the applied, isn't it? That goes to work in progress? Right? So I go ahead and I pick up the applied, which was 56. Calculators. Oboes, please. Oboes. If you were in the symphony, would if you were if you were an oboe player in the symphony, would you show up to the symphony without your oboe? If you were an oboe player in the symphony, would you show up to the symphony without the oboe? No. They're expecting you to, you know, do at the right time. They can't just have, you know, be up there doing Swan Lake. And when the oboe part comes, you're like, oh, sorry, I forgot my oboe today. Just, just use your imagination, please. Okay, so if you're in accounting class, your, inst your oboe, your instrument is your calculator, isn't it? What's the total? Huh? 100 what? 128,000? Like that? Okay, so I go ahead and I do what? I add 128,000 to this, so I end up with a, and I use subtotals for these, I end up with a subtotal of what, 148, even I can do that in my head? 148,000? Okay, now I always do a side calculation just to make sure I don't mess up. It is so easy to mess up that if I'm sitting there and I had 148 and I ended up with what? 10,000, then I must have subtracted what? 138, right? So the subtract here is 138 in order to end up with what? 10,000, right? So the subtract from work in progress is called what? Cost of goods manufactured. That is the answer to this question, right? Okay. Purely definitional. That's all that came out to was, hey, you had to know that the subtract from work in progress is called cost of goods manufactured. From there, the problem has to give you one of two things. It either has to give you the information for work in progress, or it would have to give you the information for finished goods, and you would have to what? Know that you have to figure out the add to finished goods. But it would have to have given you the beginning balance for finished goods. It would have had to give you the ending balance for finished goods. It would have had to told you what the cost of goods sold is, because that's a subtract. And then your job would have been to do what? Work up to the add, which is the cost of goods manufactured. Here they gave me all the information for work in progress. So your first job is to figure out what account am I going to have to analyze here, right? Your second job is then to go ahead and use this. And I like to do it this way, the way I showed you with this BASE. Question? Okay, good. Now, we're sitting there and we have debited our work in progress. What time does this class get out? 45. We have debited our work in progress for our um, direct material, direct labor, and our applied overhead, right? Right? And meanwhile, in the manufacturing overhead, we have debited our uh, manufacturing overhead for the actual. We credit it for the applied, right? But it's not going to match. There's going to be an amount that's going to be either under applied or over applied. If I apply too much, then the credit is going to be what? Bigger. And to turn this uh, manufacturing overhead account to zero to balance it out, I will have to do what? Debit it on the uh, debit it on the uh, on the uh, actual side. And then I'm going to have to go ahead and do what? Credit. And those costs went where? Well, first they went to work in progress. 
and then they went to finished goods, and then they went to cost of goods sold, didn't they? Okay, so they give me the option of now doing what? Going ahead and uh, crediting those to bring down that over applied out of those accounts. And I can either credit all to uh, work in progress or I can allocate it between the three work in progress, finished goods and cost of goods sold based on the relative balance of each one of those at the end of the period. Okay, now. If it is what? Over, um, under applied, that means what? That means that I have what? More actual than the applied, don't I? So now I'm going to have too many debits and not enough credits in that account. So what do I do? I go ahead and I credit the manufacturing overhead. I have to debit something and I'm going to do what? Either debit it all to work in progress or allocate it between work in progress, finished goods, and uh, cost of goods sold. And those are two different options that I can do. I, and it just depends on the materiality of those amounts. What, are, what does materiality mean? Importance. Is it important to what? Good. The decision making. Very good. The relevance is good. Is it relevant to the decision making, right? Could it change someone's decision, right? If I had known that you piled all of that in work in progress rather than allocate it, because that's the more precise method, I would have never bought your stock. So if the number is big enough to what? Change somebody's decision, a what? And when we're thinking about financial reports, we're still preparing financial reports, we're thinking about external users, we're thinking about creditors and investors, right? I would have never bought your stock. I would have never loaned you money if I had known you had just dumped that all into work in progress uh, or, or uh, excuse me, cost of goods sold is the other place you could put it all. Cost of goods sold is where you could put it all. I said work in progress. You could put it all in cost of goods sold. Okay. All right. So let's just look at uh, a numerical example. And once again, we're back to the annoying situation where they uh, sat here and put us back to what? four dollars even though it was 350 a minute ago okay and they tell me that my actual I'm just going to go ahead and do my manufacturing overhead account here on the side and they tell me that my actual is what 650 is the actual the debit or the credit huh good the actual is the debit isn't it so I debited this thing for 650 for the actual. I used my predetermined overhead rate of $4 times what? The actual number of direct labor hours incurred, which was 170. So that means I have what? Applied, good, on the credit side. And you tell me that's 680? Good. So am I under or over applied? I'm over applied. I applied too much, didn't I? Oops. Oops. That's just like when you go to Starbucks and they say, would you like cream for that? And you say, yes. And they hand you a cup that's almost spilling over. Well, where's my room for cream? I said room for cream. Take this back. Is that what you do? No, you take that and you go over to the garbage can and you go, shh. You dump a little out, right? They over applied your coffee into the cup, didn't they? No problem. Just dump a little out. So that's all we're going to do. We're going to dump a little out of this account, aren't we? How will we dump a little out of this account with debits and credits? Don't say, turn it like this, John. Did you guys see that building in Taiwan that kind of like, they had an earthquake there and the thing kind of was like toppled over like this? I was telling the guy that comes to... I bought a new house, and they give you a year to say, there's a speck of paint up there. You need to fix it. So he comes over, and he's doing that. I said, yeah, you know, they need you in Taiwan to straighten up that building. He says, what am I supposed to do? Just stand there and go like this? Okay. So what happens? We can't sit here and just, you know, tip it over. We're going to have to do what? Journal entry, aren't we? To get some amount out of there. So do we need to debit this or credit it? Good. We'll debit the manufacturing overhead. Is this thing zeroed out now? 
this thing is zeroed out now, which is where I want it to be. I want it to be zeroed out because what? I'm going to start gathering costs and work in progress next period, right? So that's all set up. That's zeroed out. And then what? And then I go ahead. I'm not work in progress, but manufacturing overhead next period. And now I just go ahead and I've got that 30,000. And that 30,000, I can either do what? Take it all to, and I think, guys, I spoke incorrectly. I said, take it all to work in progress. Your options are to take it all to cost of goods sold or to allocate it between work in progress, finished goods, and cost of goods sold based on the relative amount that's in each account. Okay, those are your options. And again, you could take it all to cost of goods sold if it's not a material amount, right? If it's material, you're really doing what? You're tremendously understating your what? Um, your net income. You're overstating your cost and understating your net income, and that could be significant, right? Especially if what? When you get to next year, when those costs should have been reported on next year's income statement, they could all of a sudden be on, uh, on, on this year's income statement and not be on next year's income statement, and a company could manipulate you. I mean, if you're an auditor and they just dump this all to cost of goods sold like this, it could be that they're setting you up. They're thinking, well, look. We're already satisfied with what our net income would have been this year. We had a good year. So we're going to go ahead and do what? Dump all of this into cost of goods sold, lower our net income this year, but that's okay because we're doing better than expected. And now we got a head start on what? Next year because we took some costs that should have been left on the balance sheet saying finished goods, saying work in progress, and we've already hit them to the income statement, right? So this could be significant uh, if it's material that they either, um, you know, that they, if it's material that they allocate it between the three. Okay, this class gets out at what time? 2.45. Okay. Okay, usually people tell me that. Yeah. Okay, all right. So we go ahead and we do what? Okay. We go ahead and in this example, they put it all to what? Cost of goods sold. They debited it. It all went to cost of goods sold, right? Or you could have to allocate it based on the account balance in each one of these. So in this case, uh, we had a total of the amount that was in all of these accounts, 68 in work in progress, 204 in finished goods, 408 in cost of goods sold, totals up what? 680, so what? 10% of the total is in work in progress, 30% is in finished goods, 60% is in cost of goods sold, they take that full 30,000 and allocate it to each depending on the relative proportion of each made up of the total balance, right? Huh? Are you messing with me now? That's a good way to be called on for every question. We're clear on that? Uh-huh. Because the pair is what? Oh, that's the name of the company? Huh? Oh, okay. Thank you. Say what? What? That's the name of the company? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, it's a made up company. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask me if three of a kind beats two pair or not. Okay. Does it? Does three of a kind be two pair? <laughs> yes, it does. How do I know? Not because I'm into poker. I learned that from uh, training day. Three of a kind beats two pair. You guys ever seen training day? All right. <laughs> so I don't know why they called it. Okay. All right. So what we'll do is uh, you can see the journal entry here where they allocated it, or they could have done it what a whole credit to cost of goods sold. Okay. So what we'll do is since we're out of time, we'll pick it up here. But uh, this is a good opportunity for you to look now at these homework questions and work at the the quiz questions. Okay. Look at them for chapter three. Look at what's been pasted in here. And we'll start with this, and I know who I'm going to call on next time, so be ready to help me out with some of these, okay? All right, guys, I will see you on Monday. Have a good uh, rest of the week. Good weekend.
extra credit. Oh yeah, it's coming. It'll show up when you least expect it. Okay, because sometimes people think, oh, he's not going to do it, and then they don't show up, and then they feel like, oh, 